Hi there. Um, as Joe says, I'm a principal engineer at the Financial Times. I'm also the tech lead for the content platform. So obviously content's quite important to Financial Times. Um, my platform is responsible for delivery, publishing of content. We build all our websites and other applications on top of our APIs. Um, and we do a lot of metadata tagging. So that's basically the, the, t the kind of functionality that I'm working in. So the FT um, has made quite a lot of changes in the way that we work over the last couple of years. So we wanted to be able to move faster. We've adopted things like continuous delivery, done a lot of automation. We're expecting teams to get much more involved in running their systems. And I think that's all a very positive thing, uh, but it gives you some challenges, because if you're really expecting people to do that, you need to empower your teams. And once you've empowered your teams, they're really resistant to you telling them what to do. So I think there's some challenges around that. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. So I'm going to start off by saying what that challenge is, in my opinion. And I'm going to talk a little bit about nudge theory, which is uh, comes is behavioral economics. It's talking about how you can influence people without mandating them to do things. So it sounds as though it's a good match for the challenge that I have. And then I'm going to talk about the things I've seen people at the FT doing that I think fit into that and make some suggestions about how you can do that yourself to try and move people, persuade people to move in a particular uh, direction. So we've, as I said, changed the way that we work. And really, it's about being able to do things quickly and try things out and take risks. And this came from board level at the FT. I was speaking to our CTO, and he said that board meetings, they started to talk about Kodak. And people often think that Kodak um, struggled because they thought film cameras were it, and that was, that was you know, they should stay there. But actually, Kodak recognized that digital cameras were, were coming, and they tried to make that transition. They just didn't execute. So the board at the FT basically said, we don't want to be in that position. So we need to be willing to try things out and quickly get feedback and, and work out whether they work. And as Dave was saying in the keynote this morning, lots of things you try out are not going to work. So the quicker that you can try them and work out that that's a dead end, the better. So um, what this means is we don't have time to wait for a decision. We can't write a big upfront design document and then wait for the architecture strategy board to have their once a week meeting to discuss this and talk about how it fits in with the other databases that we're currently using at the FT. Um, because by the time you've done that, the team is basically saying, hang on, I just need to get this, I need to do something. I have a story, I'm ready to start work on it. And actually, you don't need to build things right to get feedback. You can try things out very quickly nowadays, because you can say, well, I'll just get, get myself a SAS version of this database. I'll stick it together and cobble something together, and we'll use it, and we'll see how it works. So the number of times where, at the FT, we do something by sticking some JSON into S3 and pretending it's an API, just to get to the point of proving whether this works. It's, it's pretty good. It gives you a really quick interaction with people to see whether you completely misunderstood what you're trying to do. And continuous delivery does mean that we can get stuff out in days. Uh, when I start, first started working at the FT, we did a release once a month on a Saturday. Uh, now we're releasing 120 times a week. That's just my, my own team, my own platform. But it's a completely different world. We, we're getting stuff out really, really quickly. And as Dave was saying, it, it is great because you find out very soon whether you're completely barking up the wrong tree. Another thing we're doing is we are we're looking at that, you build it, you run it. I, I think if you want people to build good systems, they have to they have to be responsible for them beyond just shipping code. You know, it's great if you want to build a stable, well monitored service, because I'm much more likely to do that if I'm the one that gets phoned up at two in the morning when something goes wrong. It really encourages me to think about operability and monitoring and documentation and all the things that actually make it easy to run your system. The flip side of that is it Good luck trying to persuade a team to support something if you force them to use a database that they all think is the wrong tool for the job. We <coughs> had a conversation with uh, our team when we were starting to talk about doing overnight support and said, Where, what's your concerns around doing this? And they weren't really around process. They tended to be around software choices. You know, They'd say, actually, this RDF store um, falls over if you look at it. I really don't want to be responsible for trying to get it working again. Also, no one else is using it, so I can't go on Stack Overflow and get any clue what that error message means. So you have to let teams make their own choices. And those teams are actually, it starts to skew some of your choices towards boring technology, because you have a sense that you would be li likely to see that someone else has had the same problem. And it's been tested. Lots of people have used it. 
prime example on my team is uh, Kafka. And I went to a conference last year, and someone put up this slide to say, Kafka's great when you're talking about stuff that's valuable in aggregate, where you have huge throughput of data. So um, my team are publishing content. We care about every single publish that we do, and we probably do less than 1,000 article publishes a day. So we're using Kafka because the decision was made by the architecture review board about four years ago. But it isn't really the best tool for us for that particular use case. And it might work for the other team at the FT that's using it, but there's no reason for us to, to be doing the same thing. So you have to, if you want people to support their, their, their systems, then you have to let them build those systems in a way that works for them. But, and this is where I'm thinking about this more as a member of the technology leadership than as a member of a delivery team. What happens when that project finishes? Right, great, you wrote it in Scala. Good fun for you. The person that's now going to be uh, supporting this doesn't know Scala. They know Java. Every time they look at your code, they're trying to work out what this actually means. Um, and that happens a lot. You move on from your project, and someone else has to, has to keep it going. And if there's 18 different languages that are, that are being used, that's much, much harder. And then you actually want people to move teams. I think you want developers to move teams because it keeps them interested and they can learn new things. And you also want them to move teams because it helps you, because they take good ideas from one team into another. Well, if you start having very different ways of working in the team, so let's say you, you, you know moving a team would mean I'm going to move from coding in Java to coding in Go. I'm going to be deploying to Heroku, not AWS. I'm going to be using synthetic monitoring rather than acceptance tests. You might find that people are more reluctant to move, partly because they, there's a fear element of, I won't know any of this stuff. And there's also an element of, actually, I've spent 15 years learning how to be a very good Java developer, and you're asking me to use this language <laughs> that isn't as good, in my opinion. I, I've got a few people on my team who feel quite strongly about this. But that is a block for people, and we should be thinking about, about that when we're, when we're making these decisions. And then there are the higher level goals. So we've recently had a restructuring at the FT where very strongly told delivery is very important. You have the freedom to deliver things. Do what you need to get stuff delivered. But there are still things that you actually care about separately. I don't want the FT to be in the news for being hacked. It's not a good look. Uh, cost control. Well, so we're using AWS. As a developer, and I can spin up my own, uh, my own VM, there's probably a push for me to, to overspec it because there's less likely to be a problem with it. But actually, from the company's point of view, you don't want people spinning up VMs, forgetting about them, giving them far too much uh, memory and CPU, um, basically gold plating everything. If you've got any kind of um, operations team, first line, maybe second line, who need to be the first point of call, even just to work out what the problem is, it's much harder for them if they've got to look in five different places to see the logs or to see the monitoring. And if teams are totally going off in separate directions, that's, that's what's going to happen. You end up spending half an hour trying to work out where the problem is because you can't find it. And then there's just general uh, support that you have in a company. So quite a lot of our developers over the last couple of years have moved away from Windows to Macs or to Linux. But our IT service desk is, hasn't really caught on until quite late that this is something that needed to happen. So we don't have anyone that can support Linux, really. And there's fewer people who, who understand how to support Macs. And it sounds trivial, but actually it's, it's a big deal when you've got a lot of people. And then there's stuff for the good of people. And I think um, there's both kind of a moral side of this as well as a sort of sensible cost side of this. Is I don't really want to recruit people into the FT if I think they're going to hate it. But I also don't want to recruit them in if they're going to leave in a year because it's quite expensive to bring in people and to teach them how to, how to work on your system. So you want to provide them with... Uh, a place where they can get the career growth that, that they like and that they can switch teams. And actually, if you can't become an expert because you're always chopping and changing as you move around, that can be very off-putting for people. So there's all these things where you, know, you want your teams to be able to make choices, but you also have concerns that matter beyond a single team. So how do you, how do you uh, basically try and reconcile those two? Well, I read a book about nudge theory, and I thought, this looks a lot, some of the stuff that's been talked about looks a lot like things we're doing um, in the office. So nudge is basically a way of encouraging or guiding behavior, rather than legislating 
uh, or, or applying some kind of uh, financial penalty. So the difference would be something like um, whether you put up no littering signs and you find people versus putting bins on every post so that there's always a bin right next to you. Or the difference between um, banning or putting a tax on uh, soft drinks versus making sure that the only things near the checkout are fruit. So, th so that's basically the difference between it. So there's a couple of um, books. The one on the left is the was the it sort of introduced the whole idea. It was written by Richard um, Thaler and Cass Sunstein. I'm probably mangling their names. They are respectively an economist and a lawyer in the states, and they built on work that had been done by Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman. And Ka Daniel Kahneman later wrote Thinking Fast and Slow with some of his his ideas as well. But they basically were the first people to start saying you can you can influence things, particularly around actually happiness and health and really things that were not where it actually ended up getting used, which was in the government. And basically the reason that it's very attractive to a government is it's cheap because you don't have to pass any laws and you don't have to pay people for stuff. So if you can do something like change the way you word letters that you're sending out anyway, and particularly if you're a government, a, a couple of percent difference in what happens as a result of that can be a, a massive cost saving. So um, Cass Sunstein was uh, at the University of Ch Chicago with Barack Obama and he was asked to join his administration and there was an executive order published to say, basically, we think behavioral science can um, help you design better government policies and you should use it. It's also pretty popular in the UK. David Cameron was a big fan and uh, in 2010 formed a unit, uh, behavioral economics unit, behavioral insight, I think, but it's popularly just called the nudge unit. Um, it now employs quite a lot of people. It's involved in advice to other governments and it's been partially privatised because that's the way of things in the UK. So there's a book about it and uh, it's, it's really, it's a, uh, it's a lot of my examples come from here. It's a really good explanation of what it is to try and nudge people and how they're using it in government. So one of the things I like about it is it's data driven. The, a lot of the way it's done is using randomized controlled trials, which sounds like exactly the sort of thing that we like. You know, it's A-B testing for behavior. So I need to do a few examples, and the canonical example for nudge theory is at Schiphol Airport. And if you see the, the little black fleck, it's a picture of a fly. Basically, it's at the optimum place to avoid splashing, and it turns out <laughs> that men really like to aim at something my friend's been to the airport recently, said it's been replaced with a target now, actually, but they basically said it, it, it reduced the cleaning cost by 20%, <laughs> which if you consider the amount of a bathroom that's actually the urinals, it's quite, a, <laughs> it's quite an impressive amount of cleaning and stuff. But basically, it just persuades people without actually telling them to do what you want them to do. So a slightly more serious <laughs> example is the UK Organ Donation Register, and this is opt-in rather than opt-out, and that makes a big difference in people's behavior. So apparently about 90% of people in the UK support the idea of um, organ donation, but only 30% have signed up. So how do you persuade people to change the support for it into actual action? Well, at the end of the process of renewing your driving license or uh, car tax, you get shown a screen to encourage you to sign up to do organ donation. So. The nudge unit ran a big randomized controlled trial with eight variants. So this is probably a bit small, but the one on the top left is the standard control. It just says, um, please join the organ donation, uh, the organ donor register. The one next to it, number two, um, uses social norms. It turns out that humans generally like to fit in with what other people are doing. So you say, you know, lots of people decide to register. And this is something they've used with writing letters to people about um, tax returns. Apparently, if you basically say in the, t in the letter 90% um, of people fill out the tax return in on time, you get a significant number of people doing their tax return on time. Saves you a lot of money. So social norms are useful. The, the two on the bottom row here are actually the same message, but they decided to put pictures in. And there'd been some research that said a well-chosen picture increases the likelihood of people reacting to stuff. So it's as simple sometimes as layout and, and, and images. So they did another four. Um, there is uh, one that's in terms of negative consequences. Three people die each day because there are not enough organ donors. 
One in terms of positive consequences. You could save or transform up to nine lives as a single donor. And there's one that's about uh, reciprocity. So basically, you should do to other people what you'd want done to you. So basically, if you would use an organ transport, if, if, if you needed it, then you should sign up. And then uh, the final one is trying to point out the difference between if you support it, you really ought to basically put your money where your mouth is. So what were the results of this? So the interesting thing here, reciprocity did the best. So basically saying if you would, would benefit from this, then, then you probably should also think about doing it. Um, the social norm with the picture of people did worse than the control, which is obviously not predicted, and clearly this is why you do this kind of analysis. Um, and it turns out that people are more likely to respond to negative consequences than positive consequences in this particular case. And the difference is around 1%. And if, that, if you could basically increase by 1% the number of registrations per year, it's 96,000 additional registrations. Now, clearly, that's not the only place where we ask people to register. But if you can basically get your messaging so that it nudges people to do it, it can make a massive difference in terms of sign-up rate. And I think that's one of the, things why, the reasons why government like this is because when you're dealing with large numbers, a small change can be fairly significant. The third example is just one that I noticed, which was about travel during the 2012 Olympics. So Transport for London knew that there was going to be a lot more congestion on all of London transport during the Olympics because you're bringing in a whole lot of extra people. They're very often traveling uh, during rush hour because of when various events were planned. So they did quite a lot of communication in advance, um, especially around the sort of hotspot stations that were major commuter hubs and also somewhere, th somewhere that people would travel through to go to the Olympics. So they basically would say, it's expected to be busy in this time, and they'd give out walking maps. Um, I work at the Financial Times, London Bridge is the nearest station. There were posters up saying, you can expect to wait half an hour to get on a tube. So they're trying to encourage you to go somewhere else, go to a different station and do that. So I did take a picture on the morning of the first day of the Olympics. I've actually lost it, but this is basically what it looked like. <laughs> they were so successful <laughs> in, in persuading people to do different, different journeys that it, there was actually just no one there. It was, it was completely deserted. They, they had a massive impact in terms of 75% of the po London population made changes to their commute. So it, basically, just by being told, this is going to happen, you, you probably should think about avoiding it, this is a better way. And the, the walking maps would say, it's only actually five minutes from here to go to this other station. The interesting thing is a lot of people didn't go back to their old route, because we're, we're very much people of habit. Uh, lots of people were not actually using their best route to work, and when they went to try a different route during the Olympics, they discovered it was better, and they never went back to the old one. Um, the other thing that happened was, this is, it's hard to say here how much of this is due to how well we did in, in cycling at the Olympics, but the ride to work scheme where you basically get a subsidized bike um, and you pay back gradually um, had a massive increase in popularity. And some of that was people who, who cycled because they were avoiding the tube during the Olympics. So those are, s those are some examples. So what are, the, what are the, the points that people are using to... Um, to nudge people in these examples. Well, so the nudge unit, they work with government. They like to have an acronym that they can use when they're talking with government departments because it's always easier to, to persuade people, oh yeah, I remember that, that's, that's what I need to think about. So uh, they came up with four major areas to concentrate on. So they said, well, if you want to encourage behavior, you need to make it easy. So um, you want to make services very easy for people to use. Uh, defaults are really powerful because people don't tend to to change. So if you opt people in by default, then more people will stay in. So this is happening with pensions, for example. It's better, it's better for, to make people have to choose to opt out. And simplifying messages is important, because if people can't understand what you're trying to get them to do, they're very unlikely to do it. So if you could be extremely clear on, you need to do th take this action, much more likely for people to do it. You want uh, things to be attractive, and there are two senses in which you want it to be attractive. So first of all, you want people to notice it. So you want it to attract their attention. But well, secondly, you want them to think, uh, this looks like something I would enjoy doing. I would do for, it gives, gives me something. So you want to be upfront with, if you do this, you'll likely save 2%. This could let you do X, a any of that kind of stuff. 
So attractiveness is, is, is quite key. I said before, um, social networks are quite powerful. Um, if you can show what other people are doing, people tend to think, oh, if that's, the, that's what most people do, maybe I, sh maybe I should do that. Um, and there's some evidence that says if you say you're going to do something, um, you're more likely to actually do it. So if you literally say, next month I'm going to give up smoking, you're more likely to do that than um, if you never say that out loud. So if you can persuade people to sign up for when they're going to do something, it can help. And then the final one is about the time of intervention. You need to pick the right time. It's really, really annoying to have someone get in your face asking you to do something when you're rushing to work in the morning. It's much better if they, they get you when you're a little bit more relaxed. Um, we're really bad at working out long-term uh, benefits of something. So if you can say, here's your immediate impact of doing this, you're more likely to get people to do it. And again, planning behavior, so having an action plan just pushes people closer to actually doing it. So the acronym is EAST. And there's quite a lot of information about this online. The government has put, put lots of documentation up, up online. So, so that's basically a br very brief introduction uh, to nudge theory. It's quite an interesting read, the, the nudge, nudge unit book. Um, but I realized that lots of things we were doing at the FT sort of looked like we were using these things, even though I know that no one at the FT had read that and was, or rather I believe no one at the FT was basically trying to nudge us. Um, so the first example I want to talk about is developer tooling, um, which is kind of a story of how that developed. So when we started to think about infrastructure as code and automation, we set up a tooling team. And the very first thing they did was they built something called FT Platform. Um, which is basically, we realized how long it took us to provision uh, and set up new, new hardware. So their first aim was, well, we want to click button provisioning by developers within 15 minutes. And they basically built a whole set of infrastructure and um, tooling around that. And the impact was quite large. So, you know, we used to take forever. I, know I worked at the FT in... Uh, 2011, it really did take that long to get our production systems. And now it's basically people are moaning if it's not instant. Um, so it's a big, massive change. But that team made a lot of decisions for us. I think it, at the time, we didn't have a lot of experience of many of the things they were doing. So it was really helpful. It was a bit like training wheels. We could work out how to do some of this stuff. But if you had someone in your team who actually had used things like AWS before, it was actually deeply frustrating because they'd, they'd abstracted so much away and you couldn't do the things that you knew were possible, they'd made some decision for you. And um, they didn't really talk to their clients when they were doing this. So you know, I'm in a delivery team and they weren't really talking to the delivery team. And as an example, initially I was able to provision a VM. So I could go and say, yeah, I want this VM. But I couldn't actually deploy my application to it because I didn't have the permissions to do that because they didn't trust me. Even though I, the VM's only there because I want it, I had to get someone from our integration engineering team to do it. And that's just, that's just an example of how you can completely not think about how people are going to use this system. <coughs> and um, they basically would get to a certain point and go, right, well now we're building FT Platform 2. Well, if you're on FT Platform 1, good luck, because basically they're no longer developing that and you have to upgrade. And, and the delivery team, the last thing you're really interested in doing is stopping what you're doing so you can basically move on to the next version of some internal software. They, they have got a lot better at that and they basically did our upgrade for us the last time for the remaining things we had that were sitting on FT Platform. It's an interesting blog post by my colleague Matt Chabburn. Um, and it kind of reflects some things that happened at the FT. But really you want to be able to pick the best tools for the thing that you want to do. And that means sometimes you're not going to pick the tools offered by the internal team. They've got to be better than the tools that you can get out there in the market, or why would you use it? Um, and I think that's, so basically, that's really important, because otherwise you get slowed down, and people who aren't being held back by your internal team's decisions will just move faster. And you don't have a captive market as an internal team. If, if this is the case. You know, it's quite possible that you'll build something and no one will use it. But actually, that should never happen because you've got all the advantages. You can build something that's customized exactly to the way the FT wants to work. You can talk to your clients all the time. You can force them to talk to you. You haven't got to go and kind of find them. They're there. They're right there. So you should be able to build the best tool. One of the things this has led to for us at the FT is much more likely to have a set of separate tools and APIs than to have uh, uh, the big platform. 
because with a big platform, you have to kind of adopt it all. But if you can build a lot of tools, separate things, it's, it's, it's kind of the Unix philosophy. I can just take the bits that I want and compose them together and use them however I want. And we've definitely moved in that direction, and it's basically a lot better, and better for the tooling team because lots of their stuff gets used really heavily as a result. But if you're going to do this, it's not enough to just build it. You've actually got to, you've got to show how people could use it. You, know, you need to make it really simple um, to, to adopt this tool. And we've got someone who's in the tooling team who just sends kind of one pager things saying, ta-da, new API, here's an example of how to use it. Oh, by the way, there's a competition. If you can, if you can create a Lambda using this in five minutes, I'll give you a curly whirly. And it's amazing how successful that is at getting people to adopt and try things out. Um, you can get bo boxes of 60 curly whirlies on Amazon <laughs> for not much money, apparently, so they're just sat on a desk. So that's what happened with our tooling team. And that's one thing that we've done that, that kind of encourages people to converge on certain tools to stop all the teams going off and creating their own stuff. The other thing we've done is we've basically tried to define what it means at the FT to build a system. So, you know, our expectations. So we do expect whatever you have to be well monitored and stable and secure. And actually, we don't really mind that much about your architectural choices or which bits of hardware or software you're using as long as you meet some of those expectations. And so we can say things like, uh, you're free to choose this totally experimental technology if you support it or if you can persuade our existing quite small support team that they understand it well enough to support. Um, there is an alternative option, which is basically, if you don't want to be doing overnight support for this, then here are the tools, you, here are the languages and the databases and other things that you can use to build this. They're not that exciting, but you don't have to get woken up. If there's only a few of you in a team, that's a really sensible move. So it's all about defining what we want but not saying how that has to be delivered. So if we're wanting to encourage people to move teams and we're worried that it's difficult because it's all so different, we could just say, well, actually, it should be possible to get up and uh, go to a new team and basically be set up in 20 minutes. And if, that's, if you can do that and be basically writing code and committing it, then maybe, it's, maybe that's not too bad. One thing we have got is an engineering checklist Checklists are really good. Um, there's a book called The Checklist Manifesto, which talks about um, basically most errors we make now are not errors of ignorance. They're errors of um, inattention. You know, you forget to do something that you actually know you should do. It's not that you've really screwed up. You just forgot something. And this is mostly concentrating on sort of life and death situations like flying a plane or doing surgery. But it basically really helps to put to create a checklist and to have it there so you can basically go, oh yeah, I forgot to, I don't know, forgot to press this particular sequence of buttons. But you can obviously apply it to software development as well, which is obviously considerably less life and death in most situations. Certainly building a business uh, website. Oh, oh, actually, I meant to say, there's a really nice story in here, and I don't know, um, whether anyone's heard this idea that Van Halen, uh, the rock band, have, a, have something on their rider about having a bowl of M&Ms with all the brown ones removed. So it's one of those stories about rock star excess that they would have a rider that says that. But they've actually said that they, don't, they think that um, any venue that doesn't read closely through the instructions to the point of seeing that and doing it is very unli unlikely to be able to stage the kind of rock show that they stage. So it's effectively testing whether people can follow a set of instructions. So I think that's quite, <laughs> that's quite interesting. Um, this is part of our engineering checklist. It really starts from the very beginning of, are you, should you even be building something here? Could you buy it? I know you're excited because you're thinking you can write this cool thing, but can we buy it in? And it goes through to maintenance phase and, and basically decommissioning. And this, this isn't the whole checklist, um, but it's, there's a lot of stuff in it, and um, it doesn't really concentrate on the bits of our work that we all probably know and think about quite a lot. So it doesn't have a lot to say about build, test, deploy, because we figure most teams understand what's involved in that. But talking about things like security, yeah, actually quite a lot of teams probably don't know everything they should be doing there. And each of these has links through to supporting information to help you understand what it means to do this. 
So just talking about a few of the um, parts of it, as I said, teams who are all about delivery may not think about the total cost of ownership. And this, this links to a spreadsheet to help people work out what, you know, how long is this going to be around? Who's going to have to support it? Are we going to have to do upgrades? Will we have, will we have support costs to vendors? Just to make a proper decision about whether it's worth our effort. And really, the, the bias should be towards buying unless it's something that's really core to us as a business. If we can buy it in, we don't have to support it, generally. Um, as a business, we want to know about changes we make in production. We want to know so that if something goes wrong, we've got some ability to say, well, actually, this person just made a change. Could it be related? And we used to have um, change requests entered manually in Salesforce. I don't know who's used Salesforce here, but it's an incredibly painful process. Um, regularly, I would create this form with about 20 fields, click save, and it would it would fail validation because the start I'd, I'd spent so long filling in the form that I'd missed the start time that I'd already entered, so I'd have to change it. Um, so nobody liked that, and it's questionable value, but basically it is useful to know just the basics. So we've got, um, we've got the idea that actually for automated stuff, maybe we don't need as much information. We just literally need something to say, this build, which you can go and find information about somewhere else, was released by this person into this environment. And one of the things our tooling team did was build an API. It just sits on top of Salesforce. It's immensely easier to use. Um, and we cut down exactly what we expect people to fill in for most of these things. But they didn't just do this. They, they kind of said, well, most people are, are doing things like Jenkins jobs. So actually, if we create some, create some scripts and provide some libraries that show you exactly how to, how to use them, then you can easily create these release logs. And uh, my team basically currently deployed by merging a PR in, in GitHub that lists all the services in an environment. So when the tooling team heard about this, they came to talk to me and said, can we, can we help you so that you have a, a release log created? And I was kind of like, yeah, as long as it takes no time. And they just turned up two weeks later, helped me configure it for five minutes, and now 150 services have got the, what they want from it. They've got that release log. I care less because I know what my team are doing, but if it matters to the company, make it easy for someone like me to say, yep, yeah, that's fine. Security team have a different challenge, I think, than some other teams, because quite often you're trying to get people to do things very quickly. As in, right now, you need to do this patching. Communication is really critical. Uh, you need to get it right. So being very clear about here are the steps that you need to do, or even if the steps are actually this is, you've heard about this thing, but it's really not that bad, um, it is pretty good. But they're also quite proactive. So we've got um, white source uh, available for doing uh, vulnerability scanning. And they produced just a one pager. And I'd been ready to kind of ignore this because I assumed that it would have been bought for basically working maybe with Java, possibly with Node. But as soon as I saw it and saw that Gopher, I was like, okay, we could use this. We're mostly writing stuff in Go. Um, and it's uh, very simple. There's like four steps. So I can just follow these steps and know whether I've managed to do it. And then the final thing that, that about the way they communicate is there's a, there's a one pager of what do you do when something's gone wrong? I've lost my laptop. Um, there's a Slack bot that if you basically start talking about lost laptops, we'll put it into Slack. You know, you're constantly able to find out the information you need in the event that you've realized that there's a phishing attack underway or you've um, basically uh, lost your laptop with all of your code on it. So it's about the communication there, uh, really, as much as anything else. Health checks. So it actually really helps us it, against the... The fact that we use a lot of languages and a, a lot of different deployment systems. So we've got Node deployed on Heroku. We've got Java deployed on AWS using Puppet. We've got Go deployed in containers um, using Kubernetes on AWS. So there's a wealth of different things. But if we can just have an agreement that every um, application that you build has a health check and then it's got a standard response, there's lots of things you can do to aggregate that information. So we just say, well, this is what it should look like. Um, here is exactly what the JSON should look like. And then you can start providing useful tools to people. So um, this is basically just saying, OK, here's my service. Uh, this is the current status of the health check. Here's the business impact, the technical summary. So anyone should be able to look at that information and know something more about what it means that this, this application is not healthy. But we've got a Chrome plugin. So you can see it in a kind of very human-friendly way. 
And it's very, very easy to aggregate these health checks together in a way that lets someone look at the health of a whole system. This is an extremely rare picture of my production system with nothing that's amber, <laughs> basically. Um, but uh, it's really useful. It's like one view of it. And if you build a new service and you give it a health check, it takes two minutes to get it up on the main dashboard that everyone at the FT can look at. So by com basically complying with those standards, you gain a benefit. The common languages that we use at the FT all have libraries to make it really easy to add this in because you just write a library when you first start using it. So that kind of definition of a standard really helps to, uh, to make it people conform to something that makes it easier to support it. So sometimes people, sometimes software development communication is not people's favorite thing, particularly that kind of marketing-y, sales-y thing where you say, hey, I've written this thing, it's really cool, you should use it, and then you go and sit with people and make them use it. Um, you have to do it if you want people to do the things that matter to you. And one of the things that's, that's, um, that's really important is, is basically to uh, show things to people. So we've got a bunch of um, opportunities that we do all the time around sharing knowledge. So we've got regular lightning talks, both business and technical. We do tech talks where we invite people in to do 45 minute talk. And all of these things share information. But it, it's not just that, it also encourages people. So we had a, a, a four minute talk on Graphite and Grafana, where basically um, the, the guy came and said, oh, hey, look, I'm using it, it's really cool, look, it's really easy. And he showed us exactly how to plug it into our, um, into our services. And he'd set up a Graphite server and a Grafana server. And five minutes after this talk, my team had started pumping metrics out and were able to create dashboards. And six months later, they actually had to upgrade the servers and make them a highest level SLA because so many p people at the FT were using it. But that wasn't a top down, this is what we should use. It was a, um, it was a hey, this is so obviously better than what we're using before, everyone just migrated to it. So every time you can demo something and show that it's good, people will move to it. Circle CI, very similar, very similar thing. Um, we were all using repos in GitHub. We could see what other people were doing. We saw people were building stuff with CircleCI. It looked really simple. Um, despite the comment of probably last try before I hate YAML, um, <laughs> it's actually really straightforward to, to copy what someone else was doing and see the benefit that we got. So we pretty much moved our services to CircleCI in the space of three or four days because we could see that it was, there was a benefit of it. And related to this is about giving people information. I said earlier about the social side of everything that we do. Well, if you can show people stuff, they'll tend to react to it. So our ops team started sending out emails saying, our top 10 flapping alerts every week. And you know, as soon as you're basically sent to the entire company as an example of a team that's got loads of alerts firing, you, know, you tend to say, yeah, OK, I'll fix it. This was six months after they started sending the alerts, so I wasn't the worst. My team were not the worst team. We want to encourage people to reduce AWS costs. If you can see your costs in a graph that also gets shown up generally, then, then that's pretty handy. We want people to move to Amazon Linux because it's cheaper and we can show your potential savings by seeing what you're currently using um, and show you show what they would do. Um, having standards is great. It's better if you don't f have to make people go and read it. If you can basically do programmatic compliance, so they only need to find out about the standard when they're not following it, that could be pretty cool. So we've got some tag standards for our AWS instances where we want to say it's owned by this team, it's a production box or it's a staging box. Um, stop schedule, by default, if you're non-production, they'll get turned off at weekends and overnight. So you have to actually make a choice if you want something to be up more than that. That's quite good because it saves a lot of money. Um, but basically, there's a tag bot <laughs> that goes around and checks your tags and terminates instances that, that don't comply. It will only terminate the ones that aren't in production. <laughs> but you usually get a warning, actually, for most of the tags. Um, but then you don't really need to understand. You copy someone else. If you just basically went, I'm going to create an EC2 instance, I'm going to copy someone else's config, you, you, won't, you won't have breached the standards, you'll be fine. I think the, the major thing to think is, if, you are, if people aren't doing what you want them to do, it's actually your problem. You, you aren't communicating to them the benefits of it or the costs of them not doing it. So you just need to go back to them and, and get them to do it. Um, and you need to be willing to discuss stuff. So an example we had was we, we started using GitHub and everyone was just using their own personal GitHub accounts. And the FT said, oh, well, we don't actually, how do we know that these people are actually FT employees? So they came up with a proposal that involved everybody having their full name public on their GitHub profile. 
And a few people basically went, that there are reasons not to do that. There are quite a lot of reasons why, you know, for example, uh, women may not want to be obviously women on GitHub. They tend to get reviewed better if people don't know they're women. Um, so we said to the, to the team that were proposing this, are you sure about this? Within 20 minutes, they had an alternative approach that they had checked with the people who complained, and it worked, and they, they basically changed their mind. So there's basically a private file that maps us to, to who we are on, um, on public GitHub. But basically, they were incredibly good at responding to feedback. So how does this relate to nudge theory? Well, so this is a reminder just uh, of what it meant to be easy. Well, if you have checklists that you just go through and tick off as you do it, if you have APIs, you don't have to get someone else to do some work for you. You can just use them. Um, and if there's example code and client libraries, it's even less work for you. I just take this and I use it in my system. Um, Self-service is crucial because you don't want people to have to wait until someone sets them up with access to an API. Um, and you just need to be there to deal with questions. You know, we, we tend to have public, for every team or every sort of platform, we have a Slack channel where people who want help in using your system can come. And if I see like tumbleweed emoji in Slack, I'm usually thinking that's a bad sign for that team because people have asked you for help and you've not responded. And you've not responded for long enough for them to get basically sarcastic. Um, attractive. So you want to show people why this is going to make their life less painful. And you want to make it clear to them what the team and the FT as a whole get from, from that. Because people will do things because they say, you know, this is going to benefit us as a company. And you need that, the information to be where people can find it. You know, you don't ever want people to be saying, I know there's a document about X, but I have no idea where it is. And you do need to be a little bit more um, aware of how you get out there and talk to people. So, and you need to communicate in the places where people are. So for, at the FT, if you want to talk to developers, you go to Slack. If you want to talk to management, you go to Facebook. Um, if you don't want anyone to read it, you send an email. And if you want to talk to editorial, it turns out the only things you can do is get the editor to say it or stand in the middle of the newsroom and shout. That's literally the only way that they'll respond to, to requests to do stuff. Social side of things. Well, it's all the stuff that says this is, this is where you are on the list of how teams are, are dealing with this issue. Um, and also the whole, well, we know this isn't your priority right now, but can you agree to do it next month when your deadline is passed? So, Obviously, the showing off about stuff, this has really worked for us. We do Facebook posts, we do lightning talks, we have a, we have a technical blog, um, which I'm not going to give the details of because I'm pretty sure there's been nothing put on it for a while. Um, but also talking to client teams to say, talk about how easy this is. Getting people to represent you to say, we used this and it was really simple. And then the timely stuff, you, you do need to give people advance warning because if you're a delivery team and you've got a deadline that you've agreed and then suddenly some other team comes up and says, oh, there's an AD migration, you need to do all of this stuff, that team's not going to respond well. If they know about it months in advance and they know exactly what the requirements are, they're more likely to kind of factor it into their plans. And you obviously need to do it lots of ways because people, people will swear blind they never heard about something. I mean, posters work enormously well for us because it's really hard if there are posters on every wall to say, oh, I never heard about that. Telling people what's coming next is important because it's really annoying as a delivery team to solve a problem and then find the tooling team have written something and released it the next week because you didn't know what they were working on because you've got no idea what their backlog is. And actually doing things for people proactively. Um, first of all, it gives them a good feeling about you generally. <laughs> um, they're more likely to, to interact with you. So I talked about the challenge of, of um, if you're going to do a more DevOps approach, you have to let people make their own decisions, but you still have things that you want to do across, across the company. Um, did an introduction of nudge theory, and I've talked a bit about some of the things we've done that I think fit into that. But the summary really is, I think teams that make their own decisions can definitely move faster. Because, and because basically, they can try something, and then if it doesn't work, they can evaluate whether it's worth moving to something else. They don't have to get that signed off by anyone else. But obviously, that means you can end up with uh, three different issue tracking systems and 15 different databases. We do have three different issue tracking systems. But if you provide a good solution, teams will use it. Um, because people don't actually want to spend ages customizing things and trying to make them work. They do really want to do the interesting stuff. And tracking issue tracking is not interesting for anybody. Um, and taking the idea of being easy, attractive, social, and timely can help you decide the best way to try and persuade people to, to do the things that you want. 
So that's it for me. Thank you.